Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Google for Education uh, webinar series for 2016. My name is Chris Hart from Unstuck Learning Design. I'm a Google certified innovator and extremely excited to be uh, with you guys um, tonight. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by one of my fellow um, Google certified innovators and Google certified trainers, Anthony Speranza. Anthony, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Chris, and hello and welcome to everybody. Um, as, as you said, Chris, my name's Anthony, and um, I'm a primary school teacher in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, and uh, great to be here with you tonight. Fantastic. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, I'm going to quickly share my um, screen with you guys for a few moments. What we're going to do is to, we've actually put in the events page chat a link to this slide deck, so if you guys want to jump in the slide deck and click along with us, you are more than welcome to do that. But I'm going to just quickly share my screen. And then I'm going to, whoa, it goes a little bit Doctor Who and a bit weird. Um, we will have um, Philip Tanpoko as well, who will be joining us shortly from um, Singapore. Philip is the Google Educator Group Global, Global Program Manager for Google for Education. So we have um, a couple of GCIs, Google Certified Innovators, and a Googler for you tonight. So we hope you have a really good night. Um, so web webinars and webinars which are coming up um, soon. Uh, we've got tonight, which is Google Apps for Absolute Beginners. So hopefully, if you're not very confident with Google Apps, this will give you some confidence. Um, we also have some Google um, webinars coming up on math and magic, so using Google Apps in the uh, maths classroom. We have a couple on digital technology curriculum and coding, and we have um, one which is on awe and wonder. So um, that will hopefully be an extremely exciting one. If you guys have any suggestions for webinars that you would like to see us run, um, maybe to in the second half of this year in particular, please feel free to drop me an email at chris at uldtraining.com. Um, another note just from uh, some, for some of you guys, so I guess if you've joined in uh, this webinar tonight, you're interested in technology. Well, there is a wonderful event if you're in the Sydney area, um, the first robotics event. And this is a, 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 a fantastic event where kids learn how to design robots and do some coding. And the, um, it's actually an international event. And the free uh, APAC regional event is in the Sydney Olympic Park on the 18th and 19th of March. So if you're in the, if you're in the slide deck, you can actually um, click on this link here, and that will uh, take you to the website. So if you're in the Sydney area, you want to go along, have a look yourself, or indeed you want to take along um, some kids from school or your own family, it is a free event to go along and see how our teams have built these robots. And this year it is Castle Invasion, so it looks a really fun uh, day, all about promoting kids in STEM education, robotics, and coding. So um, essentially, I'm going to now stop sharing my uh, screen. So I'm going to do that. And um, I'm going to mute myself, and I'm going to ha just have a, a, a chat to Philip and get Philip into the um, webinar with us. But there is one thing I want to mention. Please, I would love you to use the, Q the Q and a app. I can see some of you have found it already. The Q&A app is on the right-hand side of your screen, and it is for asking questions. So I'm going to just get rid of um, the hellos and all those kind of things. Uh, out of the Q&A app just because it makes it really difficult for me as the host to um, find questions if there are lots and lots of hellos. So please feel free to chat to each other and say hello on the, event, on the events page, but use the question and answer app to ask questions. And then I will very politely in, interrupt Anthony if, um, if that's OK to get him to answer some of these questions that you guys have. Otherwise, we will pick them up at the end of the webinar. So um, hope, we very much hope you enjoy this and you hang around for uh, hang around for the rest of the webinar with us. So I'm going to hand over now to Anthony. Great, thanks, buddy. Uh, I'll just share my screen with you. Can you see that? I'm just on slide three. All good. Excellent. Okay, so I guess um, the the title of the webinar tonight: Google Apps for Absolute Beginners. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Google Drive. Um, essentially, which is, I guess, a digital storage solution for Google Apps. And we're going to be having a look at the, um, the five common native file types inside Google Drive, that being Google Docs, Slides, Sheets, Drawings, and Forms. And we might, if we get a chance, we might even talk about uh, a few of the other ones as well. Um, 
one of the common questions I get asked from um, uh, adults that are new to Google or even students that are new to Google is just that uh, uncertainty of, you know, where do I access all of my things from? And the simple answer simply is from google.com. Um, when you're at google.com and you're in your browser, um, you will notice there is a blue sign in button. If you hit that button um, and you enter in your email address and your password, you'll then see on the next screen that you'll get this little um, apps button, uh, the three by three grid. Some people call it the waffle iron. And from there you can ac access uh, your Google Drive and things like calendar, Gmail, and, and so on. So in a moment, I'm gonna jump in there and uh, show you that. Just quickly on Google Drive. So for if you went to google.com and you signed up for an account, just a regular Gmail address, you would get 15 gigabytes of storage. And that includes your drive content, any of your Google photos and any of your emails as well. Of course, if you or your students or your institution uses Google Apps for education accounts, which are specialized Google accounts that you can set up for um, educational purposes, um, all of those accounts have unlimited storage, which is really, really useful and gives us great peace of mind for us as teachers. Okay, so, um, Here's an incognito window, so I'm at google.com, and um, if you hit that sign in button, you can then sign in with your account. And so like I said, when you when you first sign in, it will look something like this, and here's that three by three grid, and I can see all of my apps inside here. So we're gonna open up Google Drive. Okay, so this is the view that you can, you can see from Google Drive, and I'll just explain uh, a couple of the most common things that we can see from here. So first of all, down the left side, um, you, if you expand this tree, you can see the, I guess, the structure of your drive content. You can see I've got a whole bunch of folders underneath, underneath here. Um, all of those also appear in this view here. And going down, you also have a useful view called Shared With Me. So this will show you anything that is incoming. So one of the great things that you can do with Google Drive is share um, files and folders to single people or multiple people. And that's a good way of uh, checking anything that has come into you that has been shared. I also find the recent view um, quite useful. Uh, this will list up the last documents that you have opened and modified. So that can be a, quite a quick way that you can find files. Um, another good way that you can find files is by starring them. So if I have an important um, file that I wanna keep for later, so I've got a, a map here of a, an event uh, that was last year, if I right click on that and select add star, um, it says star added to one file. You can see now inside my drive, there is a little star that has added to there. And so starring items sometimes, if you wanna safe keep these and you wanna be able to jump to them very, very quickly, if you star them and then select the star view, you'll then see those stars, start items appear in there, which is really, really nice. And then of course, you've got um, your trash item as well, uh, given that, our, our accounts are unlimited, particularly the one that I use for school, I'm really never deleting anything anyway. So I normally keep everything inside here on my drive. So a couple of ways that you can, I guess, manage your view inside Google Drive. This is the view that I prefer most, and that is the list view. So here I can see all my folders and files listed down like this. Um, some people actually preferred, prefer what is called the grid view. And I can toggle that by switching to this icon. And I guess one of the nice things about the grid view is that you can see a, a nice preview of these particular files here. Um, me personally, I just find it a lot easier to navigate through um, with the list view, but um, each, each to their own, I guess, um, in that regard there. Uh, one of the other things that you can do with your views is uh, sort. So right now I can sort this alphabetically, which means uh, numerical will appear up the top and um, alphabetical down there and so on. And then the files that are not contained inside any file, any folders. But then I can also say, well, let me see um, sorted by when files were last modified. So again, it would bring the most recent folders up to the top, the most recent files up to the top as well. Or let's say I wanna see um, those files that were last opened by me. Um, I can even do that by file size as well. So there's a couple of different ways that you can, um, I guess, organize your drive to suit your own purposes. Inside my drive, you'll notice that I have a couple of folders that are colored. So uh, this is a nice little feature that you can do by right-clicking on, onto a folder 
and select change color and you can choose from these particular colors here and this just means that you can maybe color code certain projects uh, or certain folders in a particular color scheme if it's useful for you uh, one thing that I will add is that if you share a folder with anybody um, that particular color that you apply that's only personal to you nobody else will see um, that particular color change that you do so I'll just change this one back here to red uh, another thing that I like to do sometimes with my files is just to rename them and add in an exclamation mark at the start of the file name so if this 2016 folder was something that I was using quite regularly and if I highlighted it red um, I know when I open up my drive it's always going to be up the top there when it's sorted alphabetically um, and that's just something that I've become quite used to um, when I'm working inside uh, Google Drive one of the other nice features um, is the activity viewer so I can access that by just clicking on this little information icon here and because I guess folders can be quite complex in terms of who have they been shared with and all of the folders files inside um, this is a folder that I use collaboratively with some peers in my school uh, back in 2014 and there's quite a directory structure that goes underneath there with all different subject areas um, you can get peace of mind of who is adding files into there and who is editing what particular files by looking through this activity viewer if you scroll down you can see um, who had been sharing particular items who had been editing them what time that edit was taken place and so on so particularly if you are uh, sharing large volume of files or if you're sharing large folders uh, this can be quite useful um, for people to use. Anthony, we've just got a couple of questions. Um, sure. One of them is, Samantha is, is loving what you're saying, but she does say, can you please talk a little bit slower? <laughs> she says, <laughs> she, she's called keep up. So, we, so, But she also had a quick question, which I will answer now, just um, about the robotics competition. Um, Samantha, if you click on the link in the slide deck or you just Google first robotics, then that will give you a, a link to that. It is a robotics competition. Uh, so definitely worth having a look at that. And then a, a quick question from Lily was about a Google equivalent for Microsoft Access. Now I don't yeah. believe that I don't believe there's a core app which does that, but I know there are some open source apps that do that. Do you have anything else on that? Uh, well, what about Office three six five? Yeah. Oh, is it, was that the question? Like, as oh, in, it, um, it was, it was, is there a Google equivalent for Microsoft Access? As in. Oh, sorry, as in the program Microsoft Access. The database thing, yeah. Database, yeah. Um, unfortunately not. I mean, um, we will have a look at Google Sheets and, um, you know, to some extent even Fusion Tables, but there is no uh, database per se. But you're right, there might be some open source stuff. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Well, I'll let you... I just want to welcome Philip as well. So Philip's, Philip's managed to join him. Even though I lied to him and gave, and gave him the wrong time, I do uh -huh. apologise. The difference between Australian standard time and summer time it is slightly different. Um, so thanks for joining us, Philip, and we'll, and we'll chat a little bit with you towards the end of the webinar. Okay, mate, so sorry, I, I shall butt out and let you guys get on. No, not a problem. Uh, one of the other things I'll show here is just the search function. Uh, this function is brilliant. Um, you know, I use this so often when I'm searching for files. Um, it, it really is quite useful. So up the top here, you can see the search. Um, you know, and you can search for a particular file by just typing in, um, you know, a particular keywords that is contained within the file or the title itself. In this case, there's a PMI, which we're going to use in a moment. But let's just say, for example, you know what, I'm looking for a file. I can't even remember what it's called, but I know that it's a presentation of some description and I know it was um, maybe created by myself. And so then if I selected presentation and I would say owned by me, meaning that it was created by me, and then click search, it will then return for me everything contained within my drive that is matches the criteria of a presentation and matches the criteria that I'm the actual uh, owner of that particular file. So the search function uh, for me is really quite good. Okay. So we're going to start by having a look at um, Google Docs. So essentially, Google Docs is a word processor. Um, it's suitable for lists, documents, um, anything at all in that particular regard. If you've got access to the slide deck, you can actually click on this particular link. 
and you'll be able to see the um, document open in front of you. I'm just going to open that up in my other profile, get that one working, So, which is PMI. Now the reason why you can see this particular document is because I have shared this with a particular level of access. So when you create a document for the first time, which actually I'll just show you how to do that very quickly. So I'm back inside my drive here and if I select new Google document, this comes up with a blank untitled document ready to go. And by default, these are private, meaning that nobody can have access to them unless I specifically share them out. So on top of, um, in the top right hand corner of Google Documents and in fact all of the native Google Documents that we'll see, that blue share button, if I click on that, at the moment I have this set up so anybody who has the link can view. So I've copied that link onto the slide deck and specified if anyone's got that link, they can view that. With a click of a button, I could change that to edit or comment, but we won't do that um, at the moment. If I wanted um, Chris to jump in on this and I wanted him to edit, I've just typed in his email address and clicked on edit and I can send him a notification as well, even add a message like to contribute and he will get an email that I have shared a document to him and he has edit access, meaning that he will then be able to make edits with me in real time. And this is one of the, for me, amazing features of Google Docs um, and Drive because everything that we're currently doing is stored on the web. We're accessing through a browser, we, we can collaborate with each other in real time and give access to various people with different levels um, as required. So this Google document here, um, one of the ways uh, sometimes which we use this uh, with our kids back at our school is to do, is to complete um, brainstorms or graphic organizers. So we're going to do a PMI chart here. Um, and what I like to do when I'm doing my PMI charts is just to change the, land, to change the orientation of the document um, by just clicking on page setup and then changing that to landscape. I also like to narrow the margins down a little bit as I find one inch is pretty generous. Um, if I click OK, often I find this particular orientation presents itself better um, on screens and also projectors um, if I was going to project this up to the front of the class. Um, there is a really, really nice YouTube video called Man by Steve Cutts. Um, it's a really short piece, only goes for about two minutes. There's no talking involved, but really, really strong visual imagery and um, stimulates a lot of questions about, um, I guess, uh, pollution, about conservation, um, about the, the way in which our world consumes uh, a lot of products. Um, and so if I, we were going to watch this with some students, we then might say, okay, well, let's do a bit of a brainstorm and we'll insert a table and we'll provide um, some columns for our students. And we'll call the first one P, which always just stands for the positives. We might put in an M, which stands for the minuses or the negatives. And then we'll put in an I, which is the questions or ideas. So after we would watch the video, um, if I wanted to, I could then enable edit access for anyone who has this link or if I wanted to share it with a particular student or if I've got uh, maybe an email address of my class, I can simply type in their email address or a particular student and then say, yep, they can edit that file, send, and then they will be able to open this and then add their ideas. So it's a really nice way of getting um, a lot of ideas down quickly without needing to email files across or move files onto USB. Simply click on the link and um, it's all there ready to go. Chris has obviously seen it. Okay, so a couple other things that I want to um, introduce into here. I'm just going to scroll down here while, while Chris is doing that. Um, and that is, there is a research tool that is quite useful inside Google Docs. And I can access that by just going to Tools and selecting Research. So this, I guess, is like a, a mini um, Google open inside the, the tab uh, of your Google document 
rather than, I guess, um, you know, essentially you could do achieve the same things by opening up a new tab, going to Google.com, and um, you know, searching up pollution, for example, and getting those results. But um, doing it through here has a couple of exa of um, advantages. For example, if I was preparing a document for my class and I searched up the term pollution. I might scroll down here and have a look at some of the web results and we can see there's an article here on uh, pollution which is Wikipedia so that's a, maybe a nice general one. Um, if I, I can click on that and see what that particular website looks like and I can also insert this link onto the document so you can see that's been hyperlinked there nicely. So maybe as a teacher you could um, do some preparation and provide three or four links for your class uh, as to you know some resources or some further reading that you wanted to do. I can see also we've got um, the WWF which might be a really good uh, website to use as well so I can insert uh, that link on there and then we've got also our local um, Environmental Protection Agency government website so I can again just insert a new row and um, insert that as well and then we could easily refer to these. And obviously students could use this research as well if they were given a topic for a, a particular project. When they're in their research stage, they could easily find different sources and pull them in very quickly and have their citations and have their references there um, all ready to go. One of the other things I can do is also search for images. So again, if I did a search here for pollution, and we're having a look at a couple of these. If I clicked on them, that open up in a new tab. But uh, I could also drag these onto the document as well. And that would appear nicely for me there. You'll also notice there's a little uh, citation, little footnote that automatically gets put um, into, the, into the footnotes of my document, uh, which is really quite nice as well. I guess that's an Tell me. For, um, especially for secondary students, uh, or well, for primary students as well, but the whole thing of when kids are doing individual research and you and they need to be citing their sources, using the research toolbar is a really powerful way to get them used to citing uh, where they get their images from, where they get their information from, rather than just copying and pasting from uh, from the net, I guess. Yeah. yeah Can I absolutely. ask you a couple of questions just while we're on? Because I have a, a loads which come in. Um, uh, Talia, you have asked, can I record this webinar? It is being recorded. It's also on YouTube, and you'll get an email with the links to that tomorrow. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. There's a few different ones here. Um, with the sharing of a Google Doc, Lucy asks, is it easier for students to ask for edit access than for you to invite them? Okay. Well, um, I guess if I was thinking about my own workflow, um, I would set up the document first and then if I am ready for the students to have edit access, um, I would turn it on at that particular point in time. Um, because as you know, there's a couple of different ways that I guess you can um, disseminate uh, documents to your class. Um, I know one that I use and a lot of other teachers use is for students to make a copy of a document. So um, right now when you, in fact, if anyone is opening up that document, um, if I just open up in my other profile and you'll notice that in this view like yours that you have, yours only has a uh, view only mode which means you can see all the edits that I've made but you can't comment and you can't edit them. And so um, what you can do is in fact just make a copy of this document. Uh, I think there's probably too many people on here at the moment or I'm not signed in so it won't let me make a copy. But if you go down file, make a copy, uh, you'll then get a personal copy only for yourself. Of course, it's not going to be shared with anybody else. Chris, does that answer the question? Um, yeah, I think so. And I guess it's also to do with how you set up your um, Google Apps domain as well. So there are some really powerful tools like Classroom is one of the things that we will have a look at in these webinars. And that's an awesome way to share documents and to, to give kids their own copies of documents editable or to share documents that way. But yeah, I guess it's, it's entirely up to you how you want to do it it's probably better to give kids edit permission when you want to rather than asking, having 30 emails with them all requesting edit permission. Um, yeah. The, well, there were just a couple more. So um, Andy says that can you transfer a document from another account? So he's got a, a document on a Gmail account. 
can you transfer it to a GIF account? I believe you can by just switching ownership. Yeah, that would probably be... Do you want to demo that? Yeah, okay. So what we might do is if I had this uh, PMI here, um, and this belongs into my um, domain, um, what I might do is if I just click... So I've just come up to the top here and click Share, and then uh, click on Advanced, and I can see here I've already got Chris here. The only thing, okay, it does, I've got it active for my domain here. So what you would do is you would uh, enter in the email address of the person or the account that you wanted to switch it to. And because I've got Chris already in here, if I switch that over to is owner and then click save changes, um, he's, then, uh, he's been then transferred the ownership. Okay, so of the documents sitting in my domain um, and it's not letting me do that. Um, if the document was in his, uh, the person who asked the question, if it's in the, their Google Apps for Education domain, their administrator may not be allowing um, that to, to happen either. Of course, you can also, I guess, if you shared view access with a personal account and then simply uh, made a copy for yourself, um, it's not entirely transferring ownership, but then you do have another copy, another instance in your own account that would probably be another way that you could address that problem. Yeah, great. Thanks, mate. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so Beverly asks, do you have to type in every student's email or can they just type in my email to create the PMI? So I think the, the, the best, best practice, Beverly, in this is whoever's administering your domain, so whoever's your administrator at school, um, is to get them to make class groups. Um, and the great thing about class groups is that if, for example, I've got an 11 French class, then I can, within that class group, I just have to type in 11 FRE, and within that group are all of the kids' emails. So I don't have to go share this to Chris, share this to Philip, share this to Anthony. I just click on my class. So the best practice is to get your administrator to, to set up um, groups for you. So the thing is, I, I guess the, the best bit of advice I can give you is get some chocolate and take that to the administrator and just put it on the uh -huh. desk and say, right, I need groups. I'm sure that will get um, be done for you. Um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, the other thing uh, you could you could do is if you gave or you provided this particular link uh, to your students and you said, okay, anybody with this link can edit, um, it's not like this particular link can be guessed very easily. Um, so, you know, you might post this somewhere or you might email it or you might shorten it and write it on the board and that might be another way you do it. But I agree 100%. The best thing to do is to set up a group and then that way you know guaranteed only those particular students are going to be able to edit it when they need to. Okay, two quick questions and I'll, I'll kind of segue in, I hope, um, back into your presentation is um, from Shelley, when you create a Google site to use with a class, is there a way to provide them with access to comment but not be able to edit the site. Yes, there is, Shelley. You can add on each page different levels of um, access. So, for example, on a page you might allow for comments whilst keeping the editing rights totally to yourself. So it's just a, it's just a setting on per page you can have different levels of um, access. And the one that you want is that you have access to edit the site, but that on each page where you want kids to make comments, you enable that in the, um, in the page menu. Um, Oh, are we talking about Google Sites? Yes. Yeah, I yep. don't believe it's possible. Um, I believe that you need edit access to be able to comment on a page on a Google Site. Okay. Okay. I did. Okay. Well, that is one that we will check out for you. <laughs> um, and the last one, which brings us back to you, Anthony, is how do we insert the links from research? Is it just a right-hand click? And that was from Samantha. Oh, yeah. Okay, we'll show you again. So I'm back on my document. If I uh, just open up the research, uh, where do you go? There it is here, research. Um, and I've got my search term. And so if I'm looking at this particular one here, when I put my mouse over it, I'll see a couple of uh, options. And if I just click insert link, wherever my cursor is on that page, uh, that will then insert, insert the link for me there. Okay, another Google document that I want to show um, is uh, this is a weekly program that uh, we use with colleagues at, uh, at my school. So obviously being a document that you can share and people can edit in real time, 
um, for when teachers are collaborating and doing their planning really makes a difference. You don't have to worry about who has particular um, items open um, at any given time. Um, and one feature that I did want to show here which is quite useful is the comment feature. So let's just say um, on Friday I can see that I might have a bit of a gap in my timetable here and I want Chris to come in and have a look and see uh, if he thinks on Friday afternoon uh, we might put something on our timetable here because uh, you know he might not be next to me or he might not be in the building, he might be at home and um, oh, I want his opinion on what he thinks about this particular uh, block in our timetable. So if I highlight over the question mark, you'll notice that this little add comment button comes up. Uh, that's been a new add-in that's come in, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you can click on that button or you can right click and select comment or wherever your cursor is on the page, you can select Control-Alt-M to bring up the dialogue as well. So if I just go ahead and highlight the question mark and then click comment, and then I'll put in here, Chris, what do you think we could do here? Click comment, and then I've left a comment on the page. So comments are quite useful to um, highlight particular areas and have discussions. Um, but the problem here is, Chris might not necessarily see this particular comment. Um, you can, in fact, turn on notifications so that you will receive an email when somebody has left any comment on your document. So I can turn this on for me, but the problem is I can't turn it on for Chris. So one thing you can do is I can tag Chris in this and leave a comment at the same time by putting in the plus sign and then starting to type in Chris's name and the auto suggest email comes up because it's a contact that I've used before. If I hadn't used it before and it wasn't coming up, I could simply just complete the address like this, press space and you'll then notice this text here, it says your mention will add people to this discussion and send an email. So I'll put in here, do you think about this time slot? then click on comment. It's then now checking if Chris has permission to comment on this. So if I just click on more options, the people mentioned can comment, share and comment, yes. And then Chris should now receive an email notification that I have commented and tagged him in this particular document. Um, and I can just go up here and double check my sharing settings now. So if I go into Share and Advanced, um, I can, the only people that can access this document, document is myself and now Chris and he can in fact uh, comment. I can give him edit access as well, which means then if he had a suggestion, he might put that in as a comment and then he could also edit the document as well if he wanted to. So that one there is quite useful and obviously, uh, Chris, I'm not sure what you're, you're doing in the background, maybe having a look at some Q&A, but if Chris wanted to, he could also leave replies under the comment thread as well. Good old free time and Friday afternoon. And um, yeah, sorry, yeah, uh, no, 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 I'm just, I'm, I'm multitasking. I'm going to just let you get on with that for a second. There are some other people who are trying to get into the webinar. Yeah, that's fine. that's fine. No problem. So, it, it, like I said, if anyone had access to the comment, they could also then leave those on there as well. So, that's uh, just a bit of a roundup of uh, Google Docs. We'll now have a look at uh, a couple of other different file types. So, the next one we'll have a look at is Google Slides. So, Google Slides is in uh, a nice way of thinking about it is simply a presentation tool, uh, really good for slideshows and slide decks. Again, um, there's an example here that everybody should be able to click on and get easy access to. I'm just going to go ahead and open this up. Uh, Chris was talking about the importance of getting students to reference and cite their work, uh, particularly when it comes to images. I think this is really important. Uh, one of the things that we do with our primary school students is get them to source uh, images that have, have a Creative Commons license, which is a particular license that allows you to legally share and attribute images uh, that are copyright free. So like a Google uh, Doc, again, 
when you open it up in your tab, you'll also see the share button and the comments. Um, and down the side here, you'll see all the different slides. So when I click on these slides, they open up here in the editor um, as so. So in fact, this is probably one of my favorite ways to use slides with students. And that is to prepare a slide deck for them with spaces for them to go and conduct some research and bring that back into the document. So the task here would be to find a Creative Commons image um, by using Wiki, uh, a source called Wikimedia Commons. And uh, Wikimedia Commons is really good because all of the image, images that are contained here are in fact all Creative Commons, so there's no copyrighted um, images on here whatsoever. And there are lots of uh, different websites that you can get Creative Commons uh, images from. So they would, they would use uh, Wikimedia Commons to find a particular image and insert them onto a slide. And if I was to share this and say everybody in my class then could edit this particular document, um, then everybody could then find um, their own slide. Uh, there's a blank one here, so I'll put in here um, E is for elephant. And I'll put in here by Anthony. And if I was going to find an image from Wikimedia, I'll just type in here elephant. Uh, all elephants, see also, click on this category. Okay, here we go. Uh, we might have a look at this one. Actually, this has taken me to Wikipedia, that's not right. I'll show you the correct way we do this with our students um, is actually, in fact, CC search. So if you went to search.creativecommons.org, uh, you get a little bit of a portal that you could conduct a Creative Commons search through a couple of different sources. So if I was going to type in here elephants and then click on Wikimedia Commons, it will then do a search um, on Wikimedia Commons because this category is so broad. If I click on category elephants, okay, there's a couple now that are starting to appear. So here's a nice elephant here. Click on this particular one. Okay, and so I have a file here that I can use. I can take this hyperlink and I can insert an image onto a slide. So I can go insert image by URL and paste that URL in there. Okay, it doesn't like that. I'll have to actually go and find the link to the direct file. Let's try again, this will be better. Okay, so this is the, the uh, page of where this particular image lives on Wikimedia. And I can even choose here by resolution. Okay, so we'll try this one and we'll paste this one in here. Okay, select. Okay, and then my image appears on here. Um, and the way in which we teach our students to reference and cite our Creative Commons images is with uh, three things, and that is the author, source, and link. Um, so the link can, be, again, be pasted in there. Uh, the source for this particular image is Wikimedia. And the, th the reason why I really like Wikimedia is that it gives you the link, it gives you the source, and it gives you the author right all in one location. Um, it's so, I mean, doing a, a search through Google Images, you can find images that, you, that are copyright free, but it's really difficult to find out uh, what the particular license is and who in fact the author is. So that's why um, most of the time we prefer uh, young students to use uh, something like uh, Wikimedia. So with these slides, I can also move them around in the order. If I needed new slides for my students, I could right click and duplicate them and um, you know, right click and delete them as well. And there is a comment function as well with Google Slides. So if I wanted uh, Chris to complete one of these, I could simply right click um, on slide eight and say comment. And then again, I could uh, tag Chris in here and I could just say, Chris, you don't have to do it now, but I'm just giving you an example. Okay, I'm commenting. Okay, so the people mentioned can comment, share and comment. Okay, and then he'll have access to do that. 
So uh, that's a, a basic overview of Google uh, Slides. Chris, do you want me to pause for some questions, or are you happy for me to keep going? No, I've got a couple of um, questions, and just to flag up, you, you have got about 10 minutes, Mr. Speranza, so, sure. um, a, so a quick question. Okay, so I'm going to leave one of the questions. Williford talks about wanting to share GIF to everyone and talks about GEG's Google Educator Groups, and I believe he's in the Philippines. And um, luckily, we have we have the global program manager with us, so um, I, we'll maybe pick that up with um, Philip in a little while. He wants to get involved in GEG's, and I'm sure Philip can, can help us with that. Um, so I'll just get rid of that question for a second, Williford, and we'll come back to that later. Um, Janine asks about having several pollution links. Can you rename them on the doc you are setting up? So I think she's talking about when you brought in several links to websites that just came up with pollution. Once you've got yeah. the link, you can, rena you can change the word, I guess, as much as you want. Um, yeah. So let's just bring that back up again. Um, I guess the problem here is the reason why they were all called pollution, I guess, is because it pulls in that title from the first word of the particular title. Um, so if we just bring up those examples again... And the first one, uh, well, one there was Wikimedia. That article, you can see the actual, um, if I bring that up, website name is called Pollution. And this one is as well. Uh, but we can easily um, edit these. So um, with any of these hyperlinks, if I right-click on them, uh, sorry, if I left-click on them and then just select Change, uh, the top where it says text, this is the text that students will see. So I could even, maybe to make this a little bit clearer, I'll put in um, the reference, uh, the source here, and then click Apply. And so then the title has changed. It says Pollution in brackets Wikimedia, and the link is going to that particular um, reference. I'll show you again on this one here. If I click on Change, this one was going to the WWF. So I'll just put in brackets here, WWF, and then click Apply and then you can easily change uh, some of those links because I agree, having pollution and pollution is probably not very helpful. Um, and there's um, another one here from Lorinda, and she asks the question, this is the age-old question. Um, Hi, is there a way to send students individual slides and combine them? Try the shared slides presentation with Year 9, and they were changing each other's. So, mm -hmm. I mean, technically you can certainly pr provide a single slide to everyone, and then you would have to copy and paste them all back together, which is a lot of work for you. But I guess the my argument around Google Apps always is that you have to teach responsibility and that it's incredibly powerful technology. But as, as Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. So I think it's about teaching kids the behaviors rather than trying to find ways around not allowing the kids to de demonstrate those behaviors. Do, does that you know what I mean? I hope that makes sense, Lorinda. You could yeah, do I would, it, I, I would abs Yeah, I would absolutely agree. I mean, um, I, I think sometimes when you first show something like this to your students, it's maybe a good opportunity just to give them five minutes to go a little bit crazy, get all their sillies out, and then just talk about, like you said, Chris, that responsibility that comes with it. Um, you know, for us, when working with primary students, we really haven't had um, any issue, uh, given that all the, the students are logged in. And um, any particular changes uh, that are made uh, can be seen. So if you go into File, see Revision History, um, not a great example because not many people are collaborating on this, but um, you'll be able to see for every point in time uh, what particular edit was made and when. So I can go all the way back to when it was first started at 12.10 versus back now. I can see the name of the person who has made that change. Um, I mean, obviously, in a class of 30, it can be a little bit difficult uh, to go through there. But um, I guess students should know that all of these changes are saved and logged against their name. And as you said, Chris, with that with that power does come that great responsibility um, for them to use it appropriately. And I guess that comes down to your, your classroom management and the culture you have in your school and your policy around, um, you know, the effective use of ICT. Great, thanks. That's the questions for now. And if, if you've probably got about seven minutes or so left, mate. Okay. I'll maybe just pick uh, one more because then I'll, I do want to just briefly talk about where you can go to to find um, some more uh, information to, to help everybody on their GAFE journey. So the last one that I'll look at for the evening is Google Drawings. So Google Drawings, uh, it really is a way that you can lay images and shapes on a canvas. 
uh, can be suitable for graphic organizers and images. So again, I've got a live example here. I'm just going to open up um, this one. I'll do that in my other profile, actually. So I'll do that from here. OK. And uh, this is an example of a mind map that uh, some of our Year 4 students uh, have created this term. Um, they're looking at chemical and physical reactions in the environment. And uh, they've been given a couple of images as stimulus. And by using Google Drawings, you can list down um, little boxes and connect them with arrows. So um, if I go up into Insert and then go Shape, now I want a little rectangle in here. And then I could edit in the text and put in my text item and put that around inside my graphic organizer. I can also copy them and uh, paste several of them to save, uh, to save time. Uh, one of the really nice things that you can do in a Google Drawing is if you were already, I guess, um, manipulating some of the colors and themes that you had, you'll notice that this student here has a slightly thicker border than what these particular items do. Um, and I wanted a new box with that particular formatting already applied. If I click on this water box first and then go shape, when I drag in that shape, hopefully it should be pink. Yep, there it is. And if I clicked on this yellow evaporation one and then click on shape and drag that in there, that should also become in yellow as well. Uh, the other thing we encourage our students to do when they are using mind maps, when it comes to connecting and showing cause and effect and relationships between these ideas, is when they're using arrow connectors. Um, you'll notice when you hover the mouse over the boxes, you get these little purple lines that appear. And so if you click on one of the purple lines, oops, and drag that to another box and connect it onto the purple dot, we'll just double check that one took place. Okay, um, this then will be anchored. Um, so then when I move this box around, um, I'm then not having to move an arrow and move a box as well, which can be uh, quite time consuming. One thing I could have done was made it the same style as the other arrow. So I can click on this arrow and then just go into new arrow, drag the lines, add another one not necessarily there. And then I've got that relationship um, there ready to go. And I can also join, I'll just select this one again, draw another box to another relationship, and then I can move those around. Um, I can also select multiple boxes by holding down the control key. So if I wanted to move something down and keep everything else, or I could select a couple at a time holding down the control key every time I press and manipulate um, the map around. So we often use these mind maps in the, at the, be the beginning of a unit to find out, okay, what are some of the things that I already know about the relationships and ideas about the topic? And then they can come in and add to them after. And it's quite good uh, to see, even in revision, um, the process that has partaken in terms of, okay, this is what I knew at the start of the term. Now, by the end of the term, I've added in all these other ideas and this is now my new understanding um, of that. So was there any questions about Google Drawings per se? Because um, we've probably got about three or four minutes and I'll just jump to the last resources. Yeah, so uh, not particularly about Google Drawings. Um, Lorinda says That's thank fine. you. Revision, re review or revision history will definitely help. Um, mm -hmm. Marion does have a question. I think I'm pretty sure Marion's New South Wales. I can check. But she asks, are there plans to allow drawings and forms on the department's uh, Google App site. Um, I guess my question, my, I would send you in the direction of Steve Wilkins at New South Wales Department of Education, Marion. I know he's done a lot to, to, um, to design and put together that. And I guess as, as a teacher, if, you, if it's not currently enabled, then you should, and you want it, I guess you can certainly ask the department to enable that for you. Um, OK, mate, sorry, back to you. No, that's fine. Um, I'll just finish then, Chris, by just uh, talking about a couple of resources that uh, I use with teachers every day and even students every day as well. So uh, the first one is the Google Drive Help Center. This really is uh, brilliant. Um, this will literally contain any question you have, maybe not uh, that question we had about the department because obviously that has to do with how the particular sector or state sets up that particular instance of GAFE. Um, but uh, simply go to support google.com slash drive 
and this is the Google Drive Help Center here. So if you want to know more information about how you upload, organize, and view files, you can simply click on this, and then we'll say, okay, um, what are the different files that I can store in Google Drive? Click on that, and it will tell me, you know, how many documents I can have, how many spreadsheets, uh, maximum file size, five terabytes. Um, you know, I can't even imagine what a five terabyte file would look like. But, um, you know, the, this support uh, site is really, really useful. Uh, further down, if you have a look at Docs, Sheets, Slides, and other apps, um, and if I clicked on the first one, Docs, Sheets, Slides, Forms, and Drawings, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to um, Forms and Sheets, but on the um, slide deck, you're welcome to go through and have a look at some of those um, examples there. So if you follow this link here, you will notice that the URL has changed. So support.google.com docs. Uh, this one here is specifically about, I'll just drop this one in here so people can access that one as well. We've been learning about hyperlinks, so I'll just highlight that and Control K is a shortcut for inserting a hyperlink. And I'm just going to paste that in there so then people can um, click on that particular document as well. Okay, so where am I? Here we are. So support.google.com forward slash docs. Um, and this is specifically about questions to do with any of these products. So if I'm looking at sheets and I want to know how you create and edit charts inside sheets, I'll just click on this getting started with charts, and then inserting a chart into a spreadsheet. Um, and then there's a nice step-by-step -step process that I can follow here. Um, and it's, the obviously you can search as well for, so if you're looking um, for, you know, how you insert row, you can conduct a search for that and find the particular article that you're looking for. So that is a really basic, um, but good go-to point as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about the certifications because I believe Philip will do so. Um, there is the Google EDU training site and the Apps Learning Centre websites as well. Um, these particular uh, certifications I know Philip will talk about. But very, very lastly, Chris, if I can also just talk about um, where you can keep your finger on the pulse, so to speak, in terms of all the updates that's been happening for Google Apps, um, you can follow the uh, Google for EDU team on Twitter or Google Plus. Um, and two worthwhile hashtags following on Twitter would be GAIF or um, hashtag Google EDU. So this is the Google for Education uh, profile. And um, the, you know, there's always something you can take away. Um, for example, today there was a nice um, uh, announcement about the, the ability to type in Google Docs using your voice which I would have been happy to demo, but we've run out of time. Um, and so that's a really nice update that's only just come in. And one of the amazing things about Google Apps is that the ability that they're always constantly refining and improving the product for us, which is great. And also, like I said, hashtag uh, GAIF, you'll be able to find uh, many people around the world that are, that are posting things that are related to all things Google Apps for Education. So for me personally, you know, connecting to other people on Twitter and Google Plus gives me a lot of um, ideas on how other educators around the world are using Google Apps. So Chris, that's all about all that I want to say. I'm happy to answer any questions, otherwise we'll leave it there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, I'm going to give you a round of applause, even though... Um, Thanks, buddy. It's a, it's a pleasure. No, really great. Thank you. And the thing about these webinars, it, uh, it's kind of twofold, is that, um, number one, we, we try to get through a lot. We want to give you a taste. We want to get you excited, see what you can do. So you might feel, this is an absolute beginner's webinar, you might still feel a little bit overwhelmed. Um, two things. You, Anthony's just pointing you in the direction of some extra help you can get, which you can go through at your own pace. And Philip's going to tell you a, a, a little bit more about that. But also, this webinar is available to watch back. This is recorded on YouTube. It's a Hangout on Air. So you can stop, pause, have a look, have a go, and then play the webinar um, again. You'll receive an email tomorrow if you've registered um, with the links to the uh, event page again, but also to the YouTube. Um, so um, thank you again, Anthony. It's always a pleasure to spend a little bit of time with you. Um, and we're going to pass over now to Philip. And um, Philip, I did introduce you before as the um, global program manager for Google Educator Group. So th you're in Singapore at the moment, is that right? Yeah, wonderful. And um, Philip is going to take us through um, the, uh, I think he's going to share his 
um, screen, and then he's going to take us through the um, certifications available for Google for Education. So I shall mute. All right, cool. Thanks, thanks for thanks, Chris, for the introduction, and um, it was an awesome presentation, um, Anthony. So. Um, for, for teachers who are very interested to know more about edu certifications, in the next eight minutes, I'll be talking more about that. So the reason why we put this up, because teachers are asking us, um, how can we test our knowledge and skills um, of learning all these tools and implementing it and implementing Google in the classroom? That's why we, I, uh, we thought of putting it, this all up together and having a global standard of what it is to become a Google certified educator. I think most of you are familiar, I think most of the teachers are pressured about growth. We all have professional development concerns. Um, we are all pressured to take our masters, et cetera, et cetera. But we also, Google, as Google, we also wanted to find our space in terms of helping teachers on the professional development growth. Um, of course, you have different definitions of growth, like physiological growth, or like a typical male problem is having tummy, tummy problems. But the growth that we wanted to focus on at Google is that in an environment, in a learning environment where students are actually getting information very fast and in their own way, how can we actually cope as teachers? Um, when we ask our students where they have learned something, maybe they will tell you, oh, I've just read it from Twitter, or maybe I've just watched a video on YouTube and I've learned the step A, B, C of that. So with that, we're thinking there's actually a critical need for teachers to also know how these web tools will work in the classroom, not only by just using it, but making sure that it's well integrated to impact learning and teaching. So um, why are we pushing for certifications? One, we wanted teachers to distinguish themselves, yourselves, as an ed tech educator. There's a lot of teachers out there, but very few are implementing Google in the classroom, and very few are, are using web, uh, the power of the internet to help students have a, to broaden their knowledge. So that's one thing. Second one, we wanted teachers to test knowledge and, theories, knowledge and skills based on a global standard. Our offerings of the exams in India is similar to our offerings and exams in US because we think if teachers have these skill sets that needed to implement Google in the classroom, they will be successful in impacting teaching and learning. So testing knowledge and skills. Third one, we wanted to recognize teachers on their exemplary skills. And fourth is learning new things. I mean, this webinar is helping us to learn the basics and also those advanced and those hidden tricks on Google Docs or in Google Drive. So certification is also one way to discover what are those things. So just for you to be familiar, what are these certifications? We have the Google Certified Educator Level 1 and the Google Certified Educator Level 2. Um, level one is a fundamental course and also the exam for basics. So if teachers just wanted to implement Google in the classroom, everything is covered by level one. But you think if you think you wanted to grow with Google and start your professional development growth uh, on our PD track, you can also take Google Certified Educator Level 2, which is more advanced. So this is beyond just implementing it or just integrating it. This is also about learning deeper the products and um, the tools to integrate it in different subject areas. If you think um, there's much more to learn, of course, you have a Google, certified, uh, Google for Education Certified Trainer, whereby these are teachers who are not just implementing it in the classroom, but are willing to train other teachers as well. So through peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, our certified trainers are, are are leading different, are innovating and de uh, developing different strategies to help teachers learn, regardless of their age or regardless of their expertise on, on computer technology. And of course, I don't know if you've heard about our innovator program that will happen soon in US. Uh, we have the Google for Education Certified Innovator. Um, beyond training teachers and beyond peer-to-peer -peer learning, we are seeing a population of, of teachers who are innovating and creating a lot of transformation strategies in their schools. So we have a lot of success stories of that. And so we have the innovator program um, wherein this is a, it's like a boot camp where people come together, where the select teachers select teachers come together to explore how can they create impact and transformation in schools. Um, but since we're talking about um, the basics, if the Google Certified Educator Level 1 caters around a lot of things on that area. Um, not, and the exam, if you, so how does the exam look like? The exam is not, is not ABCD. It's actually a performance-based exam. It's like you taking an amazing race for you to perform different tasks, and you will be graded according to that. So it's not a knowledge type kind of exam, but you doing all this and making sure that 
uh, as long as you know how to implement these things, I'm pretty sure you can pass the exam. So I actually have very little time, but if you wanted to start your own professional development today, you can go to this link, the G.co Edit Training Center, for you to see different modules that we have in different courses. And we also have the G.co Get EDU Certified if you wanted to take the Level 1 exam. Um, a while ago, I think Chris mentioned about, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, about uh, the GG, um, uh, about the GG, whereby um, some of you might be interested. GG is actually a good support. So um, you can go to google.com slash landing slash GG and click the groups. You can see there, uh, one more time, it's google.com slash landing slash GG, or you can just Google search it. Um, you can see there the groups. Um, there may be a GEG near you. I think in Australia we have six. One in one in Melbourne, um, a Fraser Coast, uh, and and four more. So, yeah. Or if you're interested to start one, just let me know. Um, you can drop an email to edu um, edu uh, Australia at google.com, and one of our teammates will surely attend to your needs. Um, and if you have feedback, let's say you're implementing this already in your class, you can also uh, drop us an email and that same email uh, for you, for us to hear those and maybe we can integrate that further on the tools. Thanks, Chris. I want time. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, I think hopefully I'd, Philip doesn't mind me saying this. Um, the team is fantastic, and if you reach out to them via Google Plus or via the email, um, you, you know they they are incredibly helpful. I think the GEG in Melbourne at the moment um, is winning with over 2,000 uh, members. So you know, jump on it. A Google Educator Group is a is a great place to get some grassroots um, learning. Just two quick questions. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll just take one of these questions um, for Philip. Is um, Williford is interested in doing the trainer certificate, but has, has hesitations due to time constraints? Can you tell us the estimated time one can allot to each of the levels, or how long would it take to do basics? Okay. Um, you mean taking the exam or reviewing for the exam? I, uh, yeah, um, I guess uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess both. If you're, if you're taking the exam, um, the maximum time is three hours in one sitting, so you cannot go to the toilet while taking the exam. So uh, three hours, I took the exam in one hour and a half. So that's uh, and yeah, so that's really possible. Um, and then in reviewing for the exam, some teachers prefer it one unit per week, so they might take 13 units of preparation. But I prepared for my exam for four hours of, uh, you know, in the zone type of review. Um, and one unit is very short. You can finish one unit in 15 minutes. So I think you can review in within four hours. And then one thing is, one tip, if you're really practicing it in the class, make your classroom as your playground and an experiment field. If you're really practicing it, practicing it in class, it's easier to pass because you're doing it every day and you're very familiar in how to do this and how to do that. Wonderful, thanks, Philip. Um, okay, so I'm going to just um, jump onto screen share for um, a second, and I'm just going to um, kind of bring this very, oops, very soon to a. Uh, um, no, you should be able to see that now. Yep. So um, yeah, and a bit of now, and finally, because our time has run out, it's always incredible to spend time with um, people who are passionate about learning and passionate about technology, as Anthony and Philip are. Um, I hope that you've got something out of this, but it's not. It's the first one of 2016, hopefully of a series. And the next one is 17th of March at 7 p.m. Melbourne time. So I'm calling it Melbourne time, just so as not to get confused between Australian summertime and Australian standard time. So if you're not sure what time it is in your country, I know we've got a few people in from Malaysia and the Philippines with us tonight, just Google it. It's 7 p.m. in Melbourne. What time is it in my country? Um, and this one is getting mathematical with Google Apps. So we're going to take a totally different um, view this time. Luke Boney, who is head of mathematics at John Monash Science School in Melbourne, is going to share how his faculty is using the whole suite of Google tools to improve collaborative learning design, assessment, and personalized feedback in math. And he's also going to do some magic tricks, which is pretty awesome. Um, so although the examples will come from mathematics, the application of tools and concepts will be valuable for anyone interested in taking a faculty approach to Google Apps. So please feel free to join us. If you've registered for this, as you, as you guys have, um, registered for this one, you will get an email um, with the information on how to register for the Mathemagical um, uh, webinar for Google App. So I'm going to stop screen sharing.
I'm going to say once again thank you um, so much to my good, very good friend Anthony Speranza. You're welcome, buddy. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, everybody. Absolutely awesome. Thank you guys for all giving up your time this evening. We hope you have um, a great one, and hopefully we'll see you on the 17th of March at 7 p.m. Melbourne time for getting mathematical math with Google Apps. Good night.